Hello fanatics, <clears throat> it seems that not only are you um, <clears throat> crafty fanatics, diamond painting fanatics, it also appears that you are true crime fanatics. <laughs> so I put it in my group that starting on Friday, today is Wednesday. I'm recording these before time because I'm enjoying it so um, but yeah it's gone down a storm in the group so um, I was going to be releasing one every Friday but depending on how they go down and if you're enjoying them I will maybe do two a week because you're enjoying them. Now, <clears throat> I've chosen a story today. It's going to be a long whip and chat because this one is a hot potato. We have people who believe he's innocent. We have people who believe he's guilty. Now, I'm going to put it out there. <clears throat> I believe he done it. My best friend, who I've known for over 30 years, believes he didn't do it. So, yeah. As you can tell by the title, you'll know who I'm talking about. <coughs> this story is very, very well known, and documentaries have been done on it. And I read in another group that there was a new one based on new evidence, but he's not getting out, so <laughs> whatever. <clears throat> I didn't watch it. So this is the story of the White House farm murders involving Jeremy Bamba. I will be Um, given my opinion on, on well throughout the whip and chat it, <clears throat> I haven't read this article at all and I scrolled it and you have an explanation into what it is then the Bamba family then that's on then health then Jeremy Bamba, then extended family inheritance, atmosphere in the house, murder weapon, police logs, logs seen at the White House farm. This is just scrolling, police investigation. Um, Julie Mugford, oh, I forgot about her. Julie Mugford, um, Bamba's arrest, the trial, appeals. Court of Appeals, campaign, it, they're all very long articles in each one. Criminal case review, and I think that's about it. So <clears throat> get comfy, get whatever you are working on, and let's go. Okay, so. Um, the White House farm murders took place near the village of Tolls Hunt Darcy in Essex. During the night of the 6th and 7th of August 1985, Neville, 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 God dear, I'm getting a little bit excited at this. It's not good. Okay. Neville and June Bamba were shot and killed inside their farmhouse along with their adopted daughter Sheila Caffell and Sheila's six-year-old twins Daniel and Nicholas Caffell. The only surviving member 
of June and Neville's immediate family was their adopted son, Jeremy Bamber, then 24 years old, who said he had been at home a few miles away when the shooting took place. The police first believed that Sheila, diagnosed with schizophrenia, had fired the shots then turned the gun on herself. But weeks after the murders, Jeremy Bamber's ex-girlfriend told police that he had implicated himself. The prosecution argued that motivated by a large inheritance, Bamber had shot the family with his father's semi-automatic rifle then placed the gun on his unstable sister's hands to make it look like a murder-suicide. <clears throat> a silencer, the prosecution said, was on the, ri was on the rifle, would have made it too long. They argued for Sheila's fingers to reach the trigger and shoot herself. Bamba was convic convicted on five counts of murder in October 1986 by a 10 to 2 majority verdict, sentenced to a minimum of 25 years and informed in 1994 that he would never be released. Oh, I didn't know that. I just thought he he had got, you know, um, a sentence that, you know, five counts of murder, so like 20 years each, you know, I just thought that, I didn't realise that he had been informed in 94, I mean, some, yeah. Uh, the Court of Appeal upheld the verdict in 2002. Wow, I'm learning stuff here as well. Bamba protested his innocence throughout, although his extended family remained convinced of his guilt. Between 2004 and 2012, his lawyers submitted several unsuccessful applications to the Criminal Case Review Commission. They argued that the silencer might not have been used during the killings, that the crime scene may have been damaged when reconstructed, <coughs> then reconstructed, that the crime scene photos were taken weeks after the murders and that the time of Sheila's death had been miscalculated. That's a whole lot of if buts and maybes, isn't it? It's like they're... I, I know from the documentary that they walked in and Taft decided that Sheila had done it and that great care wasn't taken and that the other officer was convinced Bamba done it and kind of wanted to do a proper investigation into it rather than assuming that Sheila had done it. But now they're saying that um, crime scene photos were taken weeks after and the time of Sheila's death had been miscalculated. Well, that would have been done through forensics in any murder case, you know, whether it was suicide or whatever. Uh, mind you, we're in 84, aren't we? So would, the, would it have been different in that period? Okay, carry, carry on, Cindy. Um, a key issue was whether Bamba had received a call from his father that night to say Sheila had, quote, gone berserk with a gun. Bamba said that he Bamba said that he did and that he alerted police and that Sheila fired the final shot while he and the officers were standing outside of the house. It became a central plank of the prosecu prosecution's case that the father had made no such call and that only the only reason Bamba would have lied about it, indeed, 
the only way he could have known about the shootings when he alerted the police was that he was the killer himself. So he's obviously dropped himself in it early on. See, it's a little bit different, difficult because I believe he did it. I know some of you will believe that he's innocent and you're more than free to pop it in the comments whether you think he did it or didn't do it. I, I love, I love um, hearing from you all. Okay, so, yeah, let's go to the Bamba family. June and Neville Bamba. Ralph Neville Bamba, known as Neville, was born on the 8th of June, 1924. He was 61 when he died. He was a farmer, a former RAF pilot, and a local magistrate at Witton Magistrates Court. He and his wife, June, June was born on the 3rd of June, 1924. Wow, they had birthdays like days apart. Uh, was also 61 when she died. They had married in 1949 and moved to the Georgian White House farm on Pages Lane in Tulse Hunt, Darcy, set among 300, 300 acres of tenant farmland that had belonged to June's father. The Court of Appeal described Neville as a well-built a well man, six feet four inches tall and in good physical health. This became significant because Bamba's defence suggested that Sheila, a slim woman of 28, had been able to beat and subdue her father, something that the prosecution contested. Unable to have biological children, the couple adopted Sheila and Jeremy as babies. The children were not related to each other. June suffered from depression and had been admitted to a psychiatric hospital in the 1950s, including in 1958 after Sheila's adoption, where she was given electroshock therapy at least six times. In 1982, she was treated by Hugh Ferguson, a, psychiat a psychiatrist who later saw Sheila. Wow. Okay, sounds like she's a little bit unstable herself. The Bambas were financially secure. There was the farmhouse, property in London, 300 acres of land and a caravan site. The couple gave the children a good home and private education, but June was intensely religious and tried to force her children and grandchildren to adopt the same ideas. She had a poor relationship with Sheila, who felt June disapproved of her, and June's relationship with Jeremy was so troubled that he had apparently stopped speaking to her. Sheila's ex-husband was concerned about the effect June was having on his sons. She made them kneel and pray with her, which upset him and the boys. Yeah, I, I kind of get that they're only really really young aren't they and they don't you know if mum and dad are not doing it you kind of don't want to go to nannies Daniel and Nicholas Caffell they were born on the 22nd of June in 1979 same year I was born they were six when they died. They were born to Sheila and Colin Caffell, who married in 1977 and divorced in 1980. Colin was an art student when he met Sheila. Both parents were involved in the children's upbringing after the divorce. 
Although the boys were briefly placed in foster care in 82 to 83 because of Sheila's health problems, for several months before the murders they had been living with Colin in his home in Kilburn, North London, not far from Sheila's home in Maida Vale. A week-long visit to the White House to White House Farm had been arranged for August 1985 at the Bamba's request. The plan was that the boys would visit their grandparents with Sheila before going on holiday to Norway with their father. Daniel and Nicholas were reluctant to stay at the farm. They disliked that June made them pray and in the car on, on the way asked their father to speak to her about it. In addition, Daniel had become a vegetarian and was worried about being forced to eat meat. When their father dropped them off at the house on the 4th of August, it was the last time he saw them. The boys were buried together in Highgate Cemetery. Sheila was cremated and the urn with her ashes was placed in their coffin. <coughs> it's so sad. It is, I mean, these are real people and, you know, Daniel and Nicholas were six years old. It's quite tragic. Sheila Cavell. She was born on the 18th of July in 1857, she was 28 when she died. She was born to the 18 year old, was born to the 18 year old daughter of a senior chaplain to the Archbishop of Canterbury. At his assistance, the baby was placed up for adoption. Her mother gave her up to the Church of England Children's Society two weeks after the birth and Sheila was adopted by the Bambas in October 1957. The chaplain had known Neville in the RAF and selected the Bambas from a list of prospective adopters. <coughs> After school, Sheila attended Secretarial College in Swiss Cottage, London. In 1974, when she was 17, she discovered she was pregnant by Colin Caffell. The Bambas had, arra had, an arra had arranged an abortion. Jeez. Her relationship with her mother deteriorated significantly that summer when June found Sheila and Colin sunbathing naked in a field. June reportedly, t reportedly started calling Sheila the devil's child. Oh my God. And people wonder why she had issues. If that's how you're being brought up, it's going to impact, isn't it? Yeah, I don't doubt that she was schizophrenic, but you know, that's abuse, that emotional abuse that went untreated. Sheila continued with her secretarial course and then trained as a hairdresser and briefly worked as a model with the Lucy Clayton Agency which included two months work in Tokyo. After she became pregnant again she oh my god so she had the abortion. As she, after she became Pregnant again, she married Colin at Chelmsford Registry Office in May 1977, but miscarried in the sixth month. The Bambas bought the couple a garden flat in Hampstead to help Sheila recuperate. She suffered enough, another miscarriage and then on the 22nd of June 1979, after four months of, four months after the birth, Sheila became increasingly upset on one occasion, when Colin left her 21st birthday party with another woman, 
she required hospital treatment after breaking a window with her fist. The couple divorced in May 1982. Okay, so she's... I'm trying to process this as well <laughs> as um, read it. So she was pregnant several times and then Colin's messing about. And if, if she was told that she was the devil's child for being pregnant the first time, that must have taken a strain on her every time she fell pregnant. Okay, um, after the divorce, Neville bought Sheila a flat in Maida Vale and Colin helped raise the children from his home nearby in Kilburn. Sheila decided to trace her birth mother then living in Canada. They met at Heathrow Airport in 1982 for a brief reunion, but the relationship did not develop. At around this time, she became friendly with a group of young women who nicknamed her Bambi, and who later told reporters that she was desperately insecure, often complaining about her poor relationship with her mother. There was a lot of partying and drugs, particularly cocaine, and fraternizations with older men. Sheila's brief modeling career had ended after the birth of the boys and she lived on welfare or took low paying jobs, including as a waitress for one week at school dinners, a London restaurant in which dinner was served by young women in school uniforms, stockings and suspenders. Ew. Um, there were also cleaning jobs and there was one episode of nude photography, much regretted. Wow. This is a lot to take in. Sheila's mental health continued to decline with episodes of banging her head against walls. In 1983, her family doctor referred her to Hugh Ferguson a psychiatrist who had treated June. Ferguson said that, Ferguson said Sheila was in an agitated state, paranoid and psychotic. She was admitted to St Andrews Hospital, a private psychiatric facility where Ferguson diagnosed a schizoaffective disorder. After she was discharged in September 1983, he continued seeing her as an outpatient and concluded that his first, diagnose, first diagnosis had been mistaken. He now believed that she was suffering from schizophrenia and began treating her with, yeah, I'm not even gonna try and pronounce that one, an, an antipsychotic drug. Yeah, I, I'm looking at it and I, there's no way I can pronounce that. As with all drugs. They have to give them like really long winded names. I am just going to pause here while I make a quick cup of tea. Sorry guys, I had to have a cup of tea. Cheers. <coughs> Okay, so, <clears throat> um, she's being treated with an antipsychotic drug. Ferguson wrote that Sheila believed the devil had given her the power to project evil onto others and that she could make her sons have sex and cause violence with her. She called them the, devil, the devil's children the phrase June you had used of Sheila. <coughs> she said she believed she was capable of murdering them or getting them to kill others. She spoke about suicide, although the court heard that Ferguson 
did not regard her as a suicide risk. She was admitted into St Andrews in March 1985, five months before the murders, after a psychotic episode in which she believed herself to be in direct communication with God and that certain people, including her boyfriend, were trying to hurt or kill her. She was discharged four weeks later, so a week before the murder, and as an outpatient received a monthly injection of, here we go, haloperinidol, an antipsychotic drug that has a sedative effect. From that point, the twins lived all or most of the time with Colin in Kilburn. According to Bamba, the family discussed placing the boys in daytime foster care over dinner on the night of the murders, with little response from Sheila. Well, one, she is... Um, sedated most of the time because drugs do that don't they but I wanted to bring up the point that June called her the devil's child which has now become the focus because she believes that her children are the devil's children it's stems from June, in my opinion. Okay. Despite Sheila's erratic mental state, her psychiatrist told the court that the kind of violence necessary to commit the murders was not consistent with his view of her. In particular, he said he did not believe she would have killed her father or the children because her difficult relationship was confined to her mother. Her ex-husband said the same, that despite her tendency to throw things and sometimes hit him, she had never, ha she had never harmed the children. June Bamber's sister, Pamela, testified that Sheila was not a violent person and that she had never known her to use a gun. June's niece, Anne Eaton, told the court that Sheila did not know how to use one. Bamba disputed this, of course he did, telling police that on the night of the shooting, as they stood outside the house, that he and Sheila had gone target shooting together. He acknowledged later that, she, that he had not seen her fire a gun as an adult. So there you go. Jeremy Bamba was born on the 13th of January 1961 to a student midwife who, after an affair with an, um, a married army sergeant, gave her baby to the Church of England Children's Society when he was six weeks old. His biological parents later married and had other children. His father became a senior staff member in Buckingham Palace. Neville and June adopted Bamba when he was six months old. They sent him to St Nicholas Primary, then along with Sheila to Malden Court Prep School. This was followed when he was nine. In September 1970, by Gresham's School, a boarding school in Norfolk, where he joined the cadet force. He was apparently unhappy there, mainly because of bullying and sexual assault. After leaving Gresham's with no qualifications, Bamba attended Sixth Form College and in 1978 achieved seven O-levels. Neville paid him to visit Australia where he took a scuba diving course before travelling to New Zealand. Former friends alleged that he had broken into a jeweller's shop while in New Zealand and had stolen an expensive watch. He also boasted, they said, of being involved in, a smuggle, in smuggling her heroin. He returned to England in 1982 to work on his adoptive parents' farm 
for £170 a week. Bear in mind it's the 80s, it's probably a lot. Um, and set up home, rent free in a cottage Neville owned at 9 Head Street, Goldhanger, Essex. The cottage lay 3 to 3.5 miles from the farmhouse, a five minute drive by car and at least 15 minutes by bicycle. His father also gave him a car to use and 8% of the family company. Oh, eight percent of the percent of the family company, the OC Road Campsites Limited, which ran a caravan site. To Bamba's supporters, who over the years have included MPs and journalists, he is a victim of one of Britain's worst miscarriages of justice. The Guardian took up his case at one point. One or more Guardian journalists began corresponding with him in 2006 and two interviewed him in 2011, describing him as, quote, clever and strategic. They wrote that there was something about him that made the public unsympathetic towards him. He was, quote, handsome in a rather cruel, caddish way. He seemed to ex exude arrogance and indifference. He didn't seem to display the appropriate emotions. He is reported to have passed a lie detector test in 2007. If you're devoid of emotions you will pass. <sighs> anyway, um, his detractors include his extended family and his father's former secretary Barbara Wilson. She told reporters that Bamba used to provoke his parents, riding in circles around riding in circles around his mother on a bicycle, wearing makeup to upset his father, and once hiding a bag of live rats in the secretary's car. What a lovely guy. I wonder why the public is so unsympathetic. Um when Bamba visited the farm, there were arguments, she said. Tension had apparently increased in the weeks before the murders. She said Neville had remarked about foreseeing a shooting accident. Bamba's girlfriend, Julie Mugford, alleged that he had talked about killing his family. A farm worker testified that Bamba had once said of Sheila, I'm not going to share my money with my sister. The court heard that in March that year, while discussing security at the fam family's caravan site, he had told his uncle, I could kill anybody. I could even easily kill my parents. Bamba denied having said this. The financial ties and inheritance issues within the me immediate and extended family provide provided a motive and an added layer of complexi complexity to the case. The Bamba's company, N&J Bamba Limited, was worth £400,000 in 1985. In 2016, that is the equivalent to £1,057,000. In their wills, June left £230,000, the equivalent of 608000 today, or 2016, and Neville £380,000, which was just over a million. During the murder trial, the court heard that the Bambas had left their estate to Jeremy and Sheila to be divided equally. In addition, Nev Neville's will had said that to inherit, Bamba had to be working on the farm at the time of his father's death. The court also heard from the mother of Bamba's girlfriend that Bamba had been saying June wanted to change her will to bypass him and Sheila 
and give her estate to the twins instead. That's how they got caught up in that. The parents' estate included land and buildings occupied by Bamba's cousins who were made aware after the murders that Bamba intended to sell them. Oh, okay, after the murder. <clears throat> I'm thinking, why is he discussing that? Like, but it was after the murder. It was one of those cousins who found the silencer in the gun cupboard with flecks of blood and paint that proved pivotal to the prosecution. Because of Bamba's conviction, the estate passed instead to the cousins. One moved into White House Farm while the while that cousin and several others acquired full ownership of the caravan site and other buildings. This conflict of interest became a bone of contention and did, as did the apparent failure of the police to search and secure the crime scene. Bamba argues that the family set him up, a claim that one of the group dismissed in 2010 as an absolute load of piffle. <laughs> That's Essex for you. Piffle. Um, Bamba launched two legal actions while in prison to secure a share of the estate, which the cousins said was part of an attempt to harass and vilify them. In 2003, he began a high court action to recover 1.2 million from the estate of his maternal grandmother, arguing that he should have inherited her home at Carbonell's Farm, Wicks, in Essex, which instead went to June's sister. The grandmother had cut Bamba out of her will when he was arrested, and that he was owed 17 years rent and that he was owed 17 years rent from his cousins who lived there. In 2004, he went to the High Court again to claim £326,000 share of the profit from the caravan site. The court ruled against him. Now this is happening in 2003. He has on court actions to ask for 1.2 million and 326,000 pounds in 2004. Really? They're going to rule against you because you're convicted of killing your whole family because you was avoiding sharing any of the inheritance money with anyone else and um, if a discussion was had about taking Jeremy and Sheila out of the will and giving it to the boys, the twin boys, that's how they, he had to eliminate everybody. He didn't take into account Anne Eaton. Because um, he thought he was going to get away with it. This is my opinion, guys. I'm, I'm a little bit um, prejudiced because I think he did it. <laughs> but to be in prison for killing your whole family and l let's just pretend he's innocent he, and, he, and he didn't do it. Now he's in prison and he's wrongfully convicted and he's appealing it and it's getting rejected and you know everyone's like oh mate we think you did it but he really didn't do it let's just pretend <laughs> I have to pretend <laughs> why would you be sitting in your cell trying to get 1.2 million and then that fails so then you go for 326,000 pounds you're never coming out. You're never getting out. He's been told you're never leaving prison. And 
the cousins are saying, oh, it's because he is trying to intimidate and bully and and all of that. And I, I get that. I mean, he must be fuming. But yeah, th uh, this, this is a very... Like I said in the beginning, it's a hot potato because you have people like me. Oh, people like me, I nearly dropped them all. That would not have been good. Um, people like me who believe he did do it and he's in the right place and um, I think he, I, I think he is scared that people are just going to move on and forget he exists so therefore he thinks oh, I'm going to claim for this and if I get it great if I don't well people still know I'm here that's what I think but that's my opinion and I'm sorry guys I keep throwing that at you you're all sitting there either supporting me going yeah yeah she's got a point or you're sitting there going what a load of rubbish because he didn't do it and he's entitled to that money not that he can pop out to you know a jewellers and buy an expensive watch or anything oh wait well, he doesn't does he just steals anyway <laughs> I'm sorry let's carry on <clears throat> on August the 4th our atmosphere in the house on August the 4th 1985 three days before the murders Sheila and the boys arrived at White House Farm to spend the week with June and Neville. The housekeeper saw Sheila that day and noticed nothing unusual. Two farm workers saw her the following day with the children and said she seemed happy. One of the crime scene photographs showed that someone had carved I hate this place into the cupboard doors of the bedroom in which the twins were sleeping. Oh. Bamba visited the farm on the evening of Tuesday the 6th of August. He told the court that during this visit his parents suggested to Sheila that the boys to be that the boys to be placed in daytime foster care with a local family. He said that Sheila didn't seem bothered by the suggestion and had simply said she would rather stay in London. Mm. Okay. The boys had been in foster care before, although in London rather than near White House Farm, and it had not appeared to cause a problem for Sheila. Ferguson told the Court of Appeal in 2002 that any suggestion that the children to be removed from her care would have provoked a strong reaction from Sheila, but that she might not have welcomed daytime help. A farm worker heard Bamba leave around 9.30 p.m. Barbara Wilson, the farm secretary, phoned Neville at around that time and was left with the impression that she had interrupted an argument. She said Neville was short with her and seemed to hang up in irritation, something he had never done before he was by all accounts even an even-tempered man. June Bamber's sister Paula phoned around 10 p.m. She spoke to Sheila who said she was quiet, then to June who seemed normal. Well, yeah, because June's oblivious to her behavior in um, how she treats people, so it is perfectly normal to her. She's obviously what did she say about she was quiet yeah so she's probably going on about putting the boys in care and all of that and she's just like oh whatever mum shut up in in her head but doesn't want to argue with her so she apparently doesn't seem bothered because she's not saying no that's not happening or yeah I'll think about it you know in my personal opinion because I've been there you pick your battles Murder weapon. Bamba told the court that during his visit on August the 6th, hours before the murders, 
He, loaded, he had loaded the rifle thinking he heard rabbits outside, but had not used it. Okay, he left it on the kitchen table with a full magazine and a box of ammunition before leaving the house. You've got two six-year-old children in that house. It did not, at that point, have the silencer or telescopic sight attached, he said. <clears throat> both had been on the rifle in both had been on the rifle in late July, according to a nephew, but Bamba said that his father must have removed them. The prosecution disputed this, maintaining that the silencer was on the rifle when the family was murdered. Right, so they've put the silencer on and then put it in the cupboard, is that what they mean? <clears throat> Neville kept several guns at the farm. He was reportedly careful with them, cleaning them after use and securing them. He had bought the gun, a .22 semi-automatic rifle, model 525, on the 30th of November 1984, along with a Parker Hale silencer, tele telescopic sights and 500 rounds of ammunition. Jeez, 500! Um, it, it used cartridges which were loaded into a magazine that held 10 cartridges. 25 shots were fired during the killing. So if the rifle was fully loaded to begin with, it would have had to have been reloaded at least twice. Oh my God. The court heard that the magazine became harder to load with each cartridge. Loading the tenth was described as exceptionally hard. <coughs> what the tenth bullet in the magazine, is that what they mean? Sorry, you're all screaming at me, just get on with it. Um, the rifle had normally been used to shoot rabbits with the silencer and telescopic light sight attached. The court heard that the telescopic sight had been removed with a screwdriver, but it was usually left in place because it was time consuming to realign it. Neville's nephew visited the farmhouse on the weekend of the 26th to the 28th of July in 1985, and he told the court that he had seen the rifle in the gun cupboard in the ground floor office with the sight and silencer attached. He had taken the gun out and used it for target practice. That's what everybody's saying, that it was all just stored away like that. <coughs> yep, the, the silencer was always on the gun I guess it would be because, you know, it's rather loud. Um, and then all of a sudden it's found, the silencer was found in the cupboard after the murders. Police logs. 7th of August 1985. Telephones in the farmhouse. There were three telephones at the farm on the night there were three telephones at the farm on that night all on the same landline there was usually a cream rotary phone in the main bedroom on neville's bedside table a beige statesman digital phone in the kitchen and a blue skepta 100 digital phone in the office on the first floor. <clears throat> there was a fourth phone too, an envoy cordless phone in the kitchen, but it had been picked up for repair on August the 5th. The rotary phone had at some point been moved out of the main bedroom into the kitchen where the police found it with its receiver off the hook. They found the beige statesman digital phone 
still in the kitchen, but hidden under a pile of magazines. Okay. Bamba's call to police. Bamba telephoned Chelmsford Police Station and not the 999 emergency number from his home in the early hours of the 7th of August to raise the alarm. He told them that my iPad's just gone off. Bear with me guys, I'll sort it out. I'm back. I don't know what happened, the iPad died. Um, I got it today. It is second hand, so yeah. So I'm going to have to keep an eye on that. It's on 90%, so let's see what happens. Okay, <clears throat> so um, Bamba phoned Chelmsford Police and not the 999 um, from his home on 7th of August to raise the alarm. <clears throat> That's where we were. He told them he had received a telephone call from his father at from the White House Farm landline to the landline at Bamba's home to say that Sheila had quote, gone berserk with a gun. Bamba said the line went dead in the middle of the call. Um, the prosecution argued that Bamba had received no such call and that his claim had, that his claim to have done so was part of his setting the scene to blame Sheila. Neville was severely bloodied quote marks, severely bloody at that point, according to the Court of Appeal, but the telephone had no visible blood on it. When the police examined the scene, okay, so I think he was in quite bad shape, um, and there's no blood on the phone whatsoever. <clears throat> Although it was acknowledged that no swabs had been taken, it was Bamba, the prosecution said, who had left the kitchen telephone off the hook after calling his home from White House Farm to establish part of his alibi. After Bamba telephoned the police, a British telecom officer operator checked the White House Farm line at 3.56 a.m. according to the police log and at 4.30 a.m. according to the Court of Appeal and found that the line was open. The operator could hear a dog barking. British Telecom did not at that time keep records of local calls. According to experts who, te who testified at the trial, if Neville had telephoned Bamba without replacing the receiver, the line between them would have remained open for one to two minutes. During this time, Bamba would not have been able to use his telephone. Ah, oh, okay, so how would he have called Chumpsford Police Station? Is what they're saying. Explaining why he had called a local police station and not 999, Bamba told police on the night that he had not thought it would make a difference to how soon they would arrive. He said that he had spent time looking up the number and even though his father had asked him to come quickly, he had first telephoned his girlfriend, Julie Mugford, in London, then had driven slowly to the farmhouse. How slow can you drive five minutes? Five minutes in a car and 15 minutes on a bike. How slow can you drive? <clears throat> Especially at whatever hour in the morning that call was made, there'd be no traffic on the road, or very little. Um, okay. He acknowledged that he could have called one of the farm workers but had not considered it in his Early witness statements, Bamba said that he telephoned the police immediately after receiving his father's call, then telephoned Mugford. During later police interviews, he said that he had called Mugford first. He said he was confused about the sequence of events. 
Uh -huh. <clears throat> Event log. Okay, so now we're getting to. <clears throat> Two thousand and ten, Bamba's lawyers highlighted two police logs in support of Bamba's application to have his case referred back to the Court of Appeal. The question was whether these logs support the prosecution position that there was one call that night to the police from Bamba alone. <coughs> Excuse me. Or the defence position that there were two calls, one from Neville, followed by a second from Bamba. One Mm. One log shows that Bamba rang the local police station and spoke to PC Michael West in the information room. As a result, West began an event log. This states that Bamba's call came in at 3.36am on August the 7th, 1985. Bamba maintains that he telephoned 10 minutes after his father phoned him. At trial, it was accepted that West had misread the digital clock. How do you misread a digital clock? And that the call had probably come in just before 3.26 a.m. So 10 minutes. 10 minutes difference. Oh, because he... Because... That was when West asked a civ civilian dispatcher... <clears throat> Malcolm Bonnet to send a car to the scene. The car, Charlie Alpha 5, was dispatched at 3.35 a.m. The event log noted a call from... <clears throat> and then there's... This is a the actual note. Mr. Bamber, 9 Head Street, Gold Hanger, Bamber's home address... <clears throat> Father phoned, age 62. Please come over. Your sister has gone crazy and has the gun. The phone went dead. Father, Mr. Bamba, H slash A, White House Farm. Sister Sheila Bamba, age 27, has a history of mental illness. Dispatched, CA5 to scene. Informant requested to attend scene. The court noted the, the appeal court noted that Bamba said he had tried to ring his father back at White House Farm but could not get a reply. During the trial, the court heard that Bamba said his father had not hung up after speaking and that he could hear a noise in the background. At some point PC West spoke to Bamba again on the telephone Bamba apparently complained about the time the police were taking, saying, when my father rang, he sounded terrified. He was told to go to the farm and wait for the police. Radio log. Michael Bonnet, a civilian dispatcher in Chelmsford headquarters information room, began a radio log, which kept track of messages about the situation. The radio log discusses a telephone call made at 3.26am on, on the 7th of August to Chelmsford Police Station. According to the prosecution, this is the telephone call known to have been made by Bamba, the same call that is entered into the event log. According to the defence, the radio log is not simply a duplicate log of Bamba's call, but a log separate log of a separate call to the police by Neville. The radio log is headed Daughter Gone Berserk. Wow, really? Um, quote, Mr. Bamba, White House Farm, Tulse Hunt Darcy, daughter of Sheila Bamba, age 26. So she's 26 here, 27 in the other one, and she, didn't she die at 28? That's a bit confusing. Um, daughter of Sheila Bamba, age 26, has got hold of one of my guns. It adds, message passed to CD by the son of Mr. Bamba after phone went dead. It goes on to say, Mr. Bamba has a collection of shotguns and 
one, I don't know how you pronounce that, point four tens. <coughs> and it, it includes White House Farm telephone number. The final entry says 0356 GPO, the telephone operator, have checked the phone, have checked phone line to farmhouse and confirm left off hook. The radio log shows a patrol that patrol car Charlie Alpha 7, not Ch Charlie Alpha 5, as mentioned in the event log, was sent to the scene at 3.35 a.m. Okay, so there's discrepancies in all of that, isn't there? But, not that I'm a police officer, obviously, but when you watch all these shows and then they dispatch and say, oh look, you know, there's a disturbance at White House Farm, who can attend? And then people go, oh, Charlie Alpha 7 can go, Charlie Alpha 5 can go. Just from what I've seen on TV. But yeah, it that's very confusing. And just helps his case because of the discrepancies all in it. I don't know how you can misread a digital clock. Especially being a police officer, you know, what you write down is crucial, isn't it? Oh, anyway, Cindy, just read. Right, it's going to get a little bit graphic now. Scene at White House Farm. After the telephone calls, Bamba drove to the farmhouse, as did three officers from Whitton Police Station, who later testified that Bamba had been driving much more slowly than them. They passed him. They, pa they passed him on Pages Lane and arrived at the farmhouse one or two minutes before him. His cousin Anne Eaton testified that Bamba was normally a fast driver. The group waited outside the house for a tactical firearms unit to arrive, which turned up at 5 a.m. and decided to, and decided to wait until daylight before trying to enter. Police determined that all the doors and windows to the house were shut except for the window in the main bedroom on the first floor. Using a hail loud, loud hailer, they spent two hours trying to communicate with Sheila. The only sound they reported coming from the house was a dog barking. While waiting outside, the police questioned Bamba who said, who they said seemed calm. According to the Court of Appeal, Bamba told them about the phone call from his father and that it sounded as though someone had cut the call off. He said he did not get along with his sister. When asked whether she might have gone berserk with a gun, the police said, he replied, I don't really know, she's a nutter. She's been having treatment. The police asked why Neville would have called Bamba and not the police. Bamba replied that his father was the sort of person who might want to keep things within the family. He said that he, Bamba, had called the police station rather than 999 because he didn't think it would affect how long the police would, would take to respond. Over the next few hours, he talked about cars in general with one of the officers, saying that the OC Road caravan site would be able to s stand him a Porsche. That's all very odd. Bamba told the police that Sheila was familiar with guns and that they had gone target shooting together. He said that he had been at the farmhouse himself a few hours earlier and that he had loaded the rifle because he thought that he heard rabbits outside. He had left it on the kitchen table, fully loaded, with a box of ammunition nearby. A doctor who was called to the house testified that the deaths could have occurred at any time during the night. He said Bamba appeared to be in a state of shock, 
Bamba broke down, cried and seemed to vomit. The doctor said Bamba told him about the discussion of the fam the discussion the family had had about possibly placing Sheila's sons into foster care. See, I'm reading that and I see pre premeditation, but who knows? Only he knows and he's not about to. Um, yeah. The scene inside, apparent struggle. The police entered at 7.54 a.m. using a sledgehammer to break the back door. The door had been locked from the inside with the key still inside the lock. They found five bodies with multiple, gun multiple gunshot wounds. Neville, Neville downstairs in the kitchen and the rest upstairs. 25 shots had been fired mostly at close range. In what order the family was killed is not known. A telephone was laying on one of the kitchen surfaces with its receiver off the hook next to several .22 shells. The police said chairs and stools were overturned and there was broken crockery, a broken sugar basin a broken ceiling light and what looked like blood on the floor. Neville was found in the kitchen dressed in pyjamas laying over an overturned chair next to the fireplace amid a scene suggestive of a struggle. He had been shot eight times, six times to the head and face, fired when the rifle was a few inches from his skin. The remaining shots to his body had occurred from at least two feet away. Based on where the empty cartridges were found, three in the kitchen and one on the stairs, the police concluded that he had been shot four times upstairs but had managed to get downstairs where a struggle took place and during which he was hit several times with the rifle and shot again, this time fatally. There were two wounds to his right side and two to the top of his head, which would have probably have resulted in unconsciousness. The left side of his lip was wounded, his jaw was fractured and his teeth, neck and larynx were damaged. The pathologist said, quote, he would not have been able to engage in purposeful talk. According to the Court of Appeal, there were gunshot wounds to his left shoulder and left elbow. The court heard that he had, quote, black eyes and a broken nose, linear bruising to the cheeks, lacerations to the head, linear type bruises to the right forearm, bruising to the left wrist and forearm, and three circular burn type marks to the back. The linear marks were consistent with Mr. Bamba having been struck with a long blunt object, possibly a gun. One of the pillars of the prosecution case was that Sheila could not have been strong enough to inflict this beating on Neville, who was six foot four inches and by all accounts in good health. Gee, that's brutal. I struggle reading that. June. June's body and clothing were heavily bloodstained. She was found in her nightdress with bare feet. The police believe she had been sitting up during part of the attack based on the pattern of blood on her clothing. She was found lying on the floor by the door of the master bedroom. She had been shot seven times. 
one shot to her forehead between her eyes was fired from under one foot away that that and another shot to the right side of her head would have both caused her death quickly the court heard there were also shots to the right side of her lower neck right, her right forearm and two injuries on the right side of her chest and knee Daniel and Nicholas the boys were found in their beds in their own room they appeared to have been shot while in bed the court heard that Daniel had been shot five times in the back of the head four times with the gun held within one foot of his head and once from over two feet away Nicholas had been shot three times all contact or close proximity shots Jeez. five shots to a six-year-old Oh, it's made my eyes water, guys. That, that's like... Okay, Sheila. Sheila was found on the floor of the master bedroom with her mother. She was in her nightdress, her feet were bare, and she had two bullet wounds under her chin, one of them on her throat. The pathologist said that the lower of the injuries had occurred from three inches and that the higher one was a contact injury. The higher of the two would have killed her immediately. The lower injury would have killed her too, he said, but not necessarily straight away. He testified that it would be possible for a person with such an injury to stand up and walk around, but the lack of blood on her nightdress suggests to him that she had not done this. Ah, oh, because I would have goshed. Oh my God. He believed that the lower of her injuries had happened first because it had caused bleeding inside the neck. The court heard that if the immediately fatal wound had happened first, the bleeding would not have occurred to the same extent the pattern of blood stains on her nightdress suggests that she had been sitting up when she received both the injuries. Blood and urine samples indicated that she had taken the an antipsychotic drug haloperinidol. That's the one that made her sort of comatosed um, in a sedative state, to quote the article. <coughs> Um, and several days earlier had used cannabis. There were no marks on her body, suggestive of a struggle. The firearms officer who first saw her said her feet and hands were clean, her fingernails manicured and not broken, and her fingertips free of blood, dirt or powder. There were no traces of lead dust. So no gunshot residue on her hands. The rifle magazine would have been reloaded at least twice during the killings. This would have would usually leave lubricant and material from the bullets on the hands. A scenes of crime officer DC Hammersley said there were blood stains on the back of her right hand but that otherwise her hands were clean. There were no blood, there was no blood on her feet or, de or other debris, such as the sugar that was downstairs on the floor. Low traces of lead were found on her hands and forehead at post-mortem. But the levels were consistent with the everyday handling of things around the house. 
A forensic scientist, Brian Elliott, testified that if Sheila had loaded 18 cartridges into a magazine, he would expect to see more lead on her hands. The blood on her nightdress was consistent with her own, and no trace of firearm discharge residue was on it. Given that she was wearing just a nightdress, it was hard to see how she could have carried carried the cartridges, the rifle, without the silencer or sights attached, was laying on her body, pointing up at her neck. June's Bible lay on the floor to the right of Sheila. It was normally kept in a bedside cupboard. June's fingerprints were on it, as were others that could not be identified, including one made by a child. Ooh, uh. Oh, guys, that was a little heavy. Cool. I can't imagine walking into that. Probably why I didn't become a police officer. But... Again, I, th I think when I first heard this, I've never read it this in depth to be fair, but when I first like watched the documentary and heard about the White House farm, I found it hard that people were just blaming Sheila because she was mentally unstable. And I thought, well, just because she's schizophrenic, you know, doesn't make her a murderer. And now I'm even more convinced because she... I keep saying it, only they know, but she had no significant residue on her hands or... There was no indications that she'd been walking around wielding a gun and she didn't have any, like, fibres or, you know, the sugar bowl got tipped over in a, in a struggle. She'd have had that over her, wouldn't she? Anyway, it's not for me to judge. I just think that she's innocent. <laughs> Has to be said. But, you know, like I keep saying, feel free to use the comments to let me know what you think because it's a very complex case and, yeah. <clears throat> Let's carry on. Okay, murder-suicide theory. Judging by the crime scene. I did warn you guys, this was a long whipping chat. Um, I've had to pause several times, so I don't know what time we're on, but I'm guessing uh, an hour and 20 minutes so far, and we've still got a way to go. Um, Murder-suicide theory. The police and media were at first convinced by the murder-suicide theory. DCI Thomas Jones, deputy head of the CID, was so sure Sheila had killed her family that he ordered Bamba's cousins out of his office when they asked him to consider whether Bamba had set the whole thing up. The Daily Express reported on the 8th of August, so the day after the murders, 8th of August, a farming family affectionately, affectionately, affectionately dubbed the Archers um, was slaughtered in a bloodbath yesterday, brandishing a gun taken from her father's collection, deranged divorcee Sheila Bamba, 28. So she was 28. Oh, okay. First shot her twin six-year-old sons, then gunned down her father as he tried to phone for help. Then she murdered her mother before turning the automatic 
.22 rifle on herself. This is a day after the murders, they have no proof, but it's the paper. <clears throat> the result of this, the result of this certainty was that the investigation was poorly conducted. The crime scene was burned, the blood-stained bedding and carpets apparently to spare Bamba's feelings. Oh, sorry, I've missed a line. Let me start again. The result of this certainty was that the investigation was poorly conducted. The crime scene was not secured and searched thoroughly and evidence was not recorded or preserved. Within a couple of days, the police had burned the blood-stained bedding and carpets apparently to spare Bamba's feelings. The scenes of crime officer moved the murder weapon without wearing gloves and it was not examined for fingerprints until weeks later. Three days after the killings, Bamba and the extended family were given the keys back to the house. <sighs> the police did not find the silencer in the cupboard. One of Bamba's cousins found it on the 10th of August with what appeared to be flecks of red, plain, red paint and blood and took it to another of the cousin's home. It took the police a further three days to collect it. A few days after that, it was the cousins who found a scratch on the red mantelpiece that the prosecution said was caused by the silencer during a struggle for the gun. That accounted for the fleck of red paint. Hmm, didn't know that. The Bible found near Sheila was not examined at all. Journalist David Connett writes that a hacksaw blade that might have been used to gain entry to the house lay in the garden for months. Officers did not take notes, I, I don't know what that word is, Contemp contemporaneous notes. Those that had dealt with Bamba wrote down their statements week late, weeks later. The bodies were released days after the murders and three of them, June, Neville and Sheila, were cremated. Bamba's clothes were not examined until one month later. Ten years later, all the blood samples... Or, ten years later, all the blood samples were destroyed. After Bamba was convicted, the trial judge, Mr Justice Drake, expressed concern about the, quote, less than thorough investigation. While the Times wrote about it, wrote, wrote about, quote, blunders, omissions and ineptitude. Home Secretary Douglas Hurd had requested a report on the investigation from Essex Chief Constable Robert Bunyard and in March 1989 issued a statement in the House of Commons, quote, it is clear that errors were made in the early stages of the police investigation contrary to existing force practice. <sighs> we know that they walked in, saw the horror inside the house and just ruled it as... It's maddening because Jeremy phoned the police, not 999, he phoned the police and said she was gone berserk with a gun and they've just taken his word for that. That's how it appears to me. So they're just assuming, oh, okay, yeah, you must, you must be truthful because everyone's truthful. So they've just taken his word for it that Sheila has gone berserk with a gun and killed her own kids and her parents. And then 
don't know, just not done much else about it. And I know we're talking 1980s. So, you know, you haven't got, you know, you certainly didn't have mobile phones, but, you know, if you was to phone the, whoever it is that deal with the phone calls, and if the police phoned them up and said, right, I need a call log from Cindy's house, they'll be able to tell you who called when and who called out when and they couldn't do that in the 80s and I get that you know things advance and stuff but still they've just taken his word for it that he's been truthful this call happened and well Sheila went berserk anyway enough about my opinions no one cares funeral Bamba's behaviour the inquest opened on the 14th of August 1985. The police gave evidence that it was a murder-suicide and the bodies were released. The Bambas and Sheila were cremated, the boys were buried. Bambas' behaviour before and after the funeral increased suspicion among his family that he had been involved. He sobbed during the funeral service for his parents and sister and at one point seemed to buckle and had to be supported by his girlfriend. Several family members and friends alleged that later at the wake he was smiling and joking. Shortly after the funerals he travelled to Amsterdam with Mugford and a friend where he bought a large quantity of cannabis. The travel agent who sold the tickets to the group sorry, the travel agent who sold the tickets said the group had been in high spirits. Bamba also began selling his family's belongings. Mugford's mother was offered June's car and an ad was placed in the local newspaper asking for 900 pounds for Neville's. Just after his first arrest and release in September, Bamba tried to sell 20 nude photographs of Sheila for 20,000 pounds to the Sun and went on another overseas trip with a friend, Brett, this time to Saint Tropez. Oh my goodness me. So his whole family have been massacred and he's jetting off to Amsterdam and Saint Tropez with his girlfriend and friend. Sorry guys, I have something irritating my leg. Okay, so um Fingerprints on the rifle. A print from Sheila's right ring finger was found on the right side of the butt, pointing downwards. A print from Bamba's right forefinger was on the rear of the barrel, above the stock and pointing across from the gun. He said he had used the gun to shoot rabbits. There were three other prints that could not be identified. Wow. And I dare say they called, well, I don't know, the, the way this police investigation's going. I was gonna say, I'm assuming they called the nephew in because he said that he used it and, but we can't assume that, can we? The silencer was not on the gun when the police found the bodies. It was found by one of Bamba's cousins three days after the murders in the ground floor office gun cupboard. Whether it was on the gun during the murders became a pivotal issue. Well, okay, let's pretend that Sheila did it. 
and she's going around shooting everyone, she shot herself. How did she put the silencer back in the cupboard? Okay, the prosecution maintained that the silencer had indeed been on the gun and that this meant Sheila could not have shot herself. <laughs> Just read Cindy, it says it. Forensic tests indicated that her arms were not long enough to turn the gun on herself with the silencer attached. If she had shot the others with a silencer, then realised the gun was too long for her to shoot herself, the silencer would have been found next to her body. She had no reason to return it to the gun cupboard before going back upstairs to shoot herself. Yeah, this says it much better than I do. If Sheila, if Sheila was not the killer, it meant Bamba had lied about the telephone call from his father saying Sheila had, quote, gone berserk with the gun. And there, there we have it. I mean, you know, if you just shot your whole family and then you think, oh no, I can't, I can't reach. Oh no, I'll take the silencer off. I mean, he's got loads of other guns in the house. You could have gone and got one of those. But, oh no, the silencer, I'll take that off and then I'm going to shoot myself. And then she pops downstairs, puts it in the cupboard, goes back upstairs and shoots herself. It doesn't make sense. <clears throat> the police searched the gun cupboard on the day of the murders but found nothing. Three days later, on the 10th of August, Bamba's extended family visited the farm with Basil the estate's executor. During that visit, one of the cousins, David, found the silencer and rifle sights in the cupboard. The court heard that this was witnessed by David's father and sister, as well as by Basil and the farm secretary. Yes, he asked too many people to say, yeah, he did. That's too many people. I mean, the father and the sister, fair enough. But the estate executor wouldn't just say, yeah, it was in there. And nor would the secretary. So that's too many people to confirm, in my opinion. This is all my opinion. Uh, instead of alerting police, the family took the silencer to David's sister's home. He said that it felt sticky. Oh my God. They found red paint and blood on it and the surface of it had been damaged. When police collected the silencer from them on August the 12th, five days after the murders, an officer reportedly noticed an inch long grey hair attached to it, but this had gone by the time the silencer arrived at the Forensic Science Service at Huntingdon. A scientist at the Forensic, scientist, the forensic Science Laboratory, John Hayward, found blood on the inside and outside surface of the silencer. The latter was not enough to permit analysis. The blood inside was found to be the same blood group as Sheila's, although it could have been a mixture of Neville's and June's. A firearms expert, Malcolm Fletcher, said the blood was backspatter back caused by close contact shooting. <sighs> Jeez. Uh, scratch marks on the mantelpiece. The cousins returned to the farmhouse to search for the source of the red paint on the silencer. <coughs> in the kitchen they found marks on in the red paint on the underside of the mantelpiece above 
the cooker, uh, an a, uh, AGA cooker. A sample taken by a scenes of crime officer was found to contain the same 15 layers of paint and varnish that were in the paint flake found on the silencer. Cast of the masks on the mantelpiece on, on the mantelpiece were deemed consistent with the silencer having come into contact with the mantel several times. The implication that was the implication was that the silencer had scratched the mantelpiece during a fight for the gun. Julie Mugford's statements. background so I'm trying to paint as well I should just give it up and just sit and read but I keep trying on 7th of September 1985 a month after the murders Bamba's girlfriend Julie Mugford changed her statement to police now alleging that Bamba had been planning to kill his family as a result of her second statement, Bamba was arrested the following day. Bamba and Mugford had, start date, had started dating in 1983 when she was 19 and studying for a degree in education. She had taken a holiday job in Sloppy Joe's, a pizzeria in Colchester. I remember that. Um, where Jeremy had a bar job in the evenings. During police interviews, Mugford admitted to a brief background of dishonesty. In 1985, she had been cautioned for using a friend's checkbook to obtain goods worth around £700 after it, hit, after it had been reported stolen. She said that she and the friend had she said that she and the friend had repaid the money to the bank. She also acknowledged having helped Bamba in March 1985, steal just under £1,000 from the office of the OC Road caravan site where his, that his family owned. She said that he had staged a break-in to make it appear that strangers were responsible. Statements to the police. Mogford was at first supportive of Bamba. Photographs of his parents and she and Sheila's funeral show him weeping and hanging on to her arm. During an interview with the police on the day of the murders, she said that Bamba had telephoned her at home in the early hours of August 7th between 3 and 3.30 a.m. and said, I quote, there's something wrong at home and sounded worried. She said she had been tired and had not asked what was wrong. Her position changed the following month. She had a series of rows with Bamba. He seemed to want to end the relationship and they had argued about his involvement in the murders. She told him he was a psychopath and at one point tried, tried to smother him with a pillow. During one argument on the 4th of September 1985, another woman telephoned Bamba in Mugford's presence. It became clear to Mugford that he had been seeing this woman. Mugford smashed a mirror and slapped Bamba. Then he twisted her arm up her back. Three days later, she went to the police and changed her statement. Mm. So it was all well and good while she was, um, should we say, cashing in on it. In the second statement, she alleged that between July and October 1984, Bamba had said he wished he wished 
he could get rid of them all. He had talked disparagingly, sorry, um, about his old father and mad mother, she said, who were trying to run his life. He said his sister had nothing to live for and that the twins were disturbed that his parents were paying for Sheila's expensive flat in Maidervale. That annoyed him, she said. In discussions, she said she had dismissed, the, dismissed it as idle talk. Bamba had talked about sedating his parents with sleeping pills, shooting them, then setting fire to the farmhouse. He reportedly said, to sh said Sheila would make a good scapegoat. Mugford alleged he had discussed cycling along the back roads to the house, entering the house through the kitchen window because the catch was broken and leaving, leaving it via a different window that, and leaving it via a different window that latched when it was shut from the outside. A telephone call would be made from White House Farm to his home in Goldhanger, quote, because the last phone call made would be recorded. He claimed to have killed rats with his bare hands to test whether he was able to kill, but he said it had taught him that he would not be able to kill his family, although he allegedly continued to talk about doing so. <sighs> Mugford said that she had spent the weekend before the murders with Bamba in his cottage in Goldhanger, <clears throat> where he had dyed his hair black she had seen his his mother's bicycle there. She said the prosecution later alleged that he used he had used this bicycle to cycle between his cottage and the farmhouse on the night of the murders to be avoid seeing in his car on the road. She told police Bamba had telephoned her at nine fifty PM on the sixth of August to say he had been thinking about the crime all day and was, quote, pissed off, and that it was tonight or never. A few hours later, at 3 to 3.30 a.m. on the 7th of August, she said he phoned her again to say everything's going well, something is wrong at the farm, I haven't had any sleep all night, bye honey, and I love you lots. Her flatmate's evidence suggested that that call had come through closer to 3 a.m., He called her later in the morning to tell her he called her later in the morning to tell her that Sheila had gone mad and that a police car was coming to pick her up. When she arrived with police at Bamba's cottage, she said he had pulled her to one side and said I should have been an actor. <clears throat> Later on the evening of 7th of August, she asked Bamba whether he had done it. He said no, but that a friend of his had, whom he named. The man was a plumber in the family. The man was a plumber the family had used in the past. Bamba allegedly said he had told his friend how he could enter and leave the farmhouse undetected, and that one of his instructions had been for the friend to telephone him from one of the phones in the farmhouse that had a memory redial facility so that if the police checked it it would ha he would have an alibi everything had gone as planned he said except that Neville put up a fight and that the friend had become angry and shot him seven times the friend had allegedly told Sheila to lie down and shoot herself last. Bamba said, 
the friend then placed the Bible on her chest so she appeared to have killed herself in a religious frenzy. The children were shot in their sleep, he said. Mugford said Bamba claimed to have paid the friend £2,000. <sighs> okay, so... I don't know what to do with any of that. Especially with Bamba being charged with all five counts. Because... Well, he's maintained his innocence all the way through. Now, if this actually happened, he is then indeed responsible for all five murders. So he can't even say, it wasn't me, it was a murder for hire thing. So, yeah. Anyway, <coughs> um, a, a, la a letter dated the 26th of September 1985 from the Assistant Director of Public Prosecutions who prepared the case against Bamba suggests that Mugford not be prosecuted for the burglary, the check fraud and, f a f and for a further offence of selling cannabis. She subsequently testified against Bamba in his trial in October 1986. The judge told the jury that they could convict Bamba. The judge told the jury that they could convict Bamba on Mugford's testimony alone. Immediately after the verdict was announced, Mugford sold her story to the News of the World for £25,000 which was £74,000 in 2016. <coughs> I don't know what I make of Julie Mugford. I mean, she knew things, but by this time had it sort of is she piecing together information that she knows? Or not? Who knows? But I just find it very odd that she comes out and says all this the minute she's been dumped and then tells her story. Anyway, <clears throat> Bamba's arrest. As a result of Mugford's statement, Bamba was arrested on the 8th of September 1985, as was the friend Mugford said he had implicated, although the latter had a solid alibi and was released. Bamba told police Mugford was lying because he had jilted her. He said he loved his parents and sister and denied that they had kept him short of money. He said the only reason he had broken into the caravan site with Mugford was to prove that security was poor. He said that he had occasionally gained entry to the farmhouse through a downstairs window and had used a knife to move the catches from the outside. Bear in mind there was that hacksaw blade thing outside. Um, he also said that he had seen his parents' wills and that they had left the estate to be shared between him and Sheila. As for the rifle, he told police the gun was used mostly with the silence off because otherwise it would not fit in its case. At no point has a case been mentioned, it's just been rattling around in the cupboard. But okay, Charge on, charged on the 9th of September, next day, with breaking into the OC Bay, OC Bay now, I thought it was OC Road. Okay, um, caravan site on the 25th of March 1985 and stealing 980 pounds. He was released on bail 
on the 13th of September, after which he went on holiday to San Tropez with a friend. Shortly before this, he tried to sell his life story and nude photographs of Sheila to the Sun newspaper for £20,000. Before leaving England, he returned to the farmhouse, gaining entry by really by the downstairs bathroom window. He said he did this because he had left his keys in London and needed papers from the house for a trip to France. He entered through the window rather than borrow keys from the farmhouse, from the farm's housekeeper who lived nearby. He returned to England on the 29th of September. He was arrested at Dover and charged with the murders. You have all this going on. He's either really stupid or... He's like jetting off on holiday, breaking into the house, which is what they suspect that the murderer did. He's just going there and breaking in and getting his papers that he needs and going on holiday while being looked at for murder and losing his whole family. It's, it, it's madness. Anyway, <clears throat> trial, October 1986. The trial, which lasted 18 days, opened on the 3rd of October 1986 before Mr Justice Drake and a jury of seven men and five women at Chelmsford Crown Court. The prosecution was led by Anthony Arledge, QC, and the defence by Geoffrey Rivlin, QC, supported by Ed Lawson, QC. The Times wrote that Bamba The Times wrote that Bamba cut an arrogant figure in the witness box. At one point when prosecutors accused him of lying, he replied That is what you have got to establish. Wow. The prosecution case was that Bamba, motivated by hatred and greed, had left White House Farm around 10 p.m. on August the 6th. After dining with his family to drive to his home in Head Street, Goldhanger. Later, perhaps in the early hours of the morning on the 7th of August, he had returned to the farm on his mother's bicycle, which he borrowed a few days earlier cycling along a route that avoided the main roads and approaching the house from the back he entered the house through a downstairs bathroom window taking the rifle with the silencer attached and gone upstairs he had shot june in her bed she managed to walk a few steps before collapsing and dying he had shot neville in the bedroom too but Neville was able to get downstairs where he and Bamba fought in the kitchen before Bamba shot him four times, twice in his temple, twice at the top of his head. He had sh shot Sheila in the main bedroom next to her mother and had shot the children in their beds as they slept. <sighs> Bamba then arranged the scene to make it appear that Sheila was the killer, they said. He discovered that she could not have reached the trigger with the silencer attached, so he removed it and returned it to the gun cupboard, then placed a Bible next to her body to introduce a religious theme. After removing the kitchen foam from its hook, he left the house via a kitchen window, perhaps after showering and banged the window from the outside so that the catch dropped back into position. He had, he had then cycled back to Goldhanger on his mother's bicycle. Shortly after 3 a.m. he had telephoned Mugford 
then the police at 3.26 a.m. to say that he had just received a frantic call from his father to create a delay before the bodies were discovered. He had not called 999 and had, and had driven slowly to the farmhouse and had told police that his sister was familiar with guns so that they would be reluctant to enter. The prosecution argued that Bamba had not received a telephone call from his father, that Neville was too badly injured after the first shots to have spoken to anyone, that there was no blood on the kitchen phone that had been left off the hook and that Neville would have called the police before calling Bamba. They also argued that Bam, had Bamba really received such a call, he would have dialed 999, alerted the farm workers, then made his way quickly there himself. The silencer played a central role. It was deemed to have been on the rifle when it was fired because of the blood found inside it. The prosecution said the blood had come from Sheila's head when the silencer was pointed at her. Had she discovered that, had she discovered that she could not shoot herself with the silencer attached the cord her, it would have been found next to her body. She had no reason to return it to the gun cupboard. That she carried out Um, why have we jumped to, had she discovered that she could not shoot herself with a silencer attached to the court herd, it would have been found next to her body. She had no reason to return it to the gun cupboard. That she had carried out the killings was a further discount, was further discounted because it was argued She had not recently expressed suicidal thoughts. The expert evidence was that she would not have harmed her children or her father. She had no interest in or knowledge of guns. She lacked the strength to overcome her father and there was no evidence on her clothes or body that she had moved around the crime scene or, in, or been involved in a struggle in particular, her long fingernails remained intact. Huh. So, yeah, it is certainly complex. Okay, the defence case. Just swap these, see if I can get any on the canvas at all. <laughs> Unlikely. The defence maintained that the witness who said Bamba disliked his family were lying or had misinterpreted his words. Mugford had lied about Bamba's confession, they said, because he betrayed her. Um, no one had seen Bamba cycle to and from the farm. Well, that's not bizarre at 3 a.m. There was no marks on him on the night in question that suggested he had been in a fight. No bloodstained clothing of his was recovered. He had not driven to the farm as quickly as he could have after his father telephoned because he was afraid, the defence said. There was no value in find it the finding of the hacksaw in the garden because Bamba had entered the house via the windows many times before the killings and since. The defence argued that Sheila was the killer and that she did know how to handle guns because she had been raised on a farm and had attended shoots when she was younger. She had a very serious mental illness 
had told a psychiatrist she felt capable of killing her children and loaded the rifle and cartridges and the loaded rifle and cartridges had been left on the kitchen table by Bamba. There had been a recent family argument about placing the children in foster care. A former boyfriend of hers gave a written statement to the court that Sheila had some kind of breakdown in March 1985 in his presence when she began beating the wall with her fist because the telephone line had gone dead during a call. She had said the phone was bugged and talked about God and the devil and how the devil loved her. He said he had feared for the safety of people around her. He also said Sheila had a quote deep and intense dislike of June, her adoptive mother. The defence argued that people who have carried out so-called altruistic killings have been known to engage in ritualistic behaviour before killing themselves and that Sheila might have placed the silencer in the cupboard, changed her clothes and washed herself which would explain why there was little lead on her hands or why the sugar from the floor was not found on her feet. There was also a possibility that the blood in the silencer was not hers, but a mixture of Neville's and June's. Summing up verdict. The judge told the jury that there were three crucial points in no particular order. Did they believe Julie Mugford or Jeremy Bamber? Were they sure that Sheila was not the killer who then committed suicide? He said this question involved another. Was the second fatal shot fired at Sheila with the silencer on? If yes, she could not have fired it. Finally, did Neville call Bamba in the middle of the night? If there was no such call, it undermined the entirety of Bamba's story. The only reason he would have had to invent the phone call was that he was responsible for the murders. On October 28th, after deliberating more than nine hours, the jury found Bamba guilty of a majority of 10 to 2, the minimum required for a conviction, sentencing him to five life terms with a recommendation that he serve a minimum of 25 years. The judge told him, and I quote, your conduct in planning and carrying out the killing of five members of your family was evil, almost beyond belief. In December 1994, Home Secretary Michael Howard told Bamba that he would remain in prison for the rest of his life. Following a decision in 1988 by the Home Secretary of the day, Douglas Heard. Wow. I... Yeah. What can you say? Now there is more... But because I am pretty, m I must be at a couple of hours or so. So I am going to do a part two where we cover the rest of the story because there is more. So. What are your thoughts, guys? Did Jeremy Bamba shoot his whole family? Or do you think Sheila did it? Or is there another explanation? Please do let me know what you're thinking. And... Yeah, give me a thumbs up, leave a comment and...
please make sure you're subscribed to my channel to make sure you catch part two, which is coming pretty much straight away. Well, I'm going to record it straight away. Um, we have the appeals. In 1989 and 1994, the Court of Appeal in 2002, grounds, um, I'm not sure what this is, <clears throat> oh the grounds for, um, what's the word, appeal, grounds to appeal and there's quite a few of those listed. Uh, new silence of evidence, uh, the campaign, background, campaign arguments, alleged crime scene damage, there's so much more guys, um, arguments about the scratch marks, police vlogs, Mugford's letter, criminal case review commission and more. So, please do join me for part two because yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in the counter arguments because I'm a little bit set in my ways and I think he did it. So I will see you in part two guys. Thank you for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed and I shall see you very soon. Bye for now. Hi guys, I just wanted to pop on and say if you were watching my video hopefully you were all crafting along and didn't notice but i just wanted to say that when i played it back um my voice or my microphone either way so i had to cut it redo it but obviously i have carried on painting as, as I've done so I was I was listening to myself telling the story and painting like like you guys do so that's why if you noticed hopefully you didn't that suddenly my canvas jumped from like the A to here so yeah I shall see you in part two guys Love you all.